Uh, we are in the realm of unsupervised learning for a while now. We have started with uh, generative adversarial networks, and uh, then we were reducing the amount of supervision as we were moving along. And what do I mean by that? We were reducing the number of labeled data. And this is the extreme where you're going to have a lot of unlabeled data and uh, zero labeled data. This is unlike semi-supervised learning where you had a little bit of supervision, a little bit of labels. Here you have zero labels. And this is related to representation learning. Whenever you have an image, for instance, or text or a speech, you want to turn them into vectors. You want to learn the corresponding representations of those images. And as soon as you learn the features corresponding to an image, which is going to give you a vector, on top of that, you can use uh, usual classical machine learning techniques, such as logistic regression. Let's start with uh, clustering and deep cluster. And we are going to use that to learn representations. What is the key motivation for such an idea of trying to cluster the representations coming out of a neural network to work? The key observation is if you put a multi-layer perceptron classifier, a few layers are fully connected, perhaps with one or two non-linearity or perhaps one or two layers. If you put that on top of a convolutional neural network, perhaps pick your favorite convolutional neural network, perhaps AlexNet, remove the fully connected layers at the end, keep only up until the last convolution, modify the head to something else. And uh, this AlexNet is not pre-trained. So it isn't randomly initialized. It's a random neural network. But then what you're going to be training is only the head this multi-layer perceptron, given the classes from ImageNet. So the body of your neural network is a CNN. It is randomly initialized. The head of your neural network, you're going to train it while fixing, while freezing the first few layers, the CNN layers, the AlexNet layers. You're only modifying the head. That one on its own is going to get you 12% accuracy. What does it mean? 12% is a lot for ImageNet. If you compare it to chance, you have 1,000 classes. And if you randomly predict one of the classes as the prediction of your model, that's going to be only 0.1% accurate because this is going to be 1 over 1,000. That's the probability of randomly selecting the correct class. So 12% is a lot. And where is that coming from? It's coming from CNNs and those convolutional structure, giving you a lot of prior knowledge. You're encoding a lot of uh, prior knowledge in the structure of a CNN, like locality of the statistics, your kernels being stationary, you're using the same kernel and shifting it over your image. So there is a lot of structure in the, con in the, uh, in the structure of a convolutional neural network. So there is a lot of prior knowledge. Let's leverage that. We are in the realm of unsupervised learning, so you are not going to have any labels here. These are unlabeled data, and you have n of them, zero labels. And using that, you want to train a neural network that is going to give you some general purpose features or representations that then you can transfer to downstream tasks. What is the idea here? You take your images, you push them through your convolutional neural network. This is the entire data set. This is the entire ImageNet data, all of them, 1 million images. You take all of them, push them through your convolutional neural network, and then cluster them, cluster the vectors that are going to come out. If things were random, or if CNNs weren't uh, carrying in them some knowledge on its own, then this strategy wouldn't work. This is going to give you random clusters. But this is going to give you a good initial guess for your clusters. And let's say here you're choosing three clusters. You could have uh, multiple clusters. That's a hyperparameter that you choose. Now, all of the images whose representation are in the green cluster, let's label them with green, perhaps label them with one. All of the 
orange ones, let's label them with uh, two corresponding to orange. The blue ones, let's label them with three. Or if you have more clusters, perhaps 1,000 clusters, you're going to have 1,000 labels now. Now your data is labeled, which is nice. We can put a classification head on top of your convolution and classify and backpropagate and train the parameters of your CNN. And then the next round, hopefully your CNN is learning more. You take those images, push them through your CNN, cluster them, classify, go back, and then update the parameters of your neural network. Is the big picture clear? Okay, perfect. In that case, let's go into the details. What is K-means doing? You have your images, you push them through your neural network, that's gonna give you your features. Now you want to cluster those features into K distinct groups. For clustering, you're gonna know, you're gonna put your cluster centers in a matrix. In the figure here, D is two dimensional. This is one dimension, this is the other dimension. So each one of these uh, circles is two dimensional. D is two, and then K is three in that figure. One, two, three. But in general, K could be large and D could be large. Perhaps D is a multiple of two or a power of two. That's going to give you your central matrix. And then you are going to need these cluster assignments for each image because these are basically your classes. These are one hot vectors. What does clustering do? Or actually K-means do? The parameters of your neural network is fixed when you are doing your clustering. You are going to have one million perhaps two-dimensional data here, or one million d-dimensional data in this space. That's what this means. And whenever you are multiplying a matrix by a one-hot vector, you are choosing one of these centroids. You are selecting one of these columns. Depending on why, you're going to select one of them. And these are one-hot vectors. So they're going to, one of them is going to be one, the other ones are going to be zero. If uh, y for a particular data is, for instance, the green one here. We're going to have a 1, 0, 0. And then this is going to give you C1, a D dimensional vector. This is going to give you C2. That's going to give you C3. So you are going to have three cluster centers. When it comes to clustering, not only you need to find C, but also you need to find the cluster assignments. And K means is going to help you do that. You start with some random cluster assignments, the stuff the observations that are in cluster one, you average them out, hence the name mean, and that's going to give you C1. C2, C3, you compute in the same thing. In the next round, each data is going to end up being either closer to C1, to C2, or C3. You make an assignment. You figure out the assignment. So that's an expectation minimization algorithm. The expectation is when you're finding the mean, when you're finding your centroids, and uh, maximization because you're uh, finding the cluster assignments. And then in the end, K-means is going to give you the optimal assignments, which you are going to use as pseudo labels, and it's going to give you the optimal centroids or the centroid matrix. Was K-means clear? Okay, perfect. And you have to do it on the entire data. This is the part of the algorithm, which is the bottleneck. You take your entire data, you cluster them. But once you have your labels, you can do mini batch uh, stochastic gradient descent here. But here you need your entire data set. So there is a comment in the chat. Our results with k-means will depend slightly on how we initialize our centroids correctly. Yes. So you're going to have uh, some random restarts for your C. And uh, let's assume that k-means is a robust algorithm. And k-means has been around for more than half a century. So people have been uh, working on the k-means and clustering algorithms for a while now. If you assume that you can do clustering efficiently, which in these days you are going to be able to, then this problem is solved. But then uh, after that is solved, the rest of it is classification. Does that answer your question? Yes, no? Okay, perfect. You are going to put for the classification part of your problem, you are going to have a neural network, which is a CNN, is going to extract the features. On top of that, you're going to put a shallow neural network, perhaps one layer or two layers deep, and you're going to train both of them. This is where the parameters of your neural networks, G and F, are going to get adjusted. 
through back propagation and stochastic gradient descent. And this is the usual cross entropy loss. You're maximizing the likelihood. Okay, perfect. In theory, you sit behind the computer, you code up the idea, and then you're going to end up with some trivial solutions. Why is that? Because after the clustering, you might end up with some empty clusters. In the extreme, it might happen that all of your observations are put into one cluster, and then basically you are collapsing into one class, and there is not going to be any discrimination and no learning, and you are basically finding a constant function. This is a big issue with self-supervised learning. You are going to always end up with trivial solutions, and you have to try to avoid them because the same function is trying to help train itself and then you can end up with trivial solutions easily. How can you mitigate that? It's not a perfect solution, but throughout the training, if at some point a particular cluster ends up becoming empty, you randomly select a non-empty cluster, it's going to have a centroid. You take that centroid, uh, create a couple of copies of it with random perturbations, and then you reassign. Basically, you're dividing this green portion into perhaps three other portions, three other clusters. You're forcing it to uh, separate. After you do the reassignment, then you're going to have your classes to train your CNN. Another problem that could happen is you might have unbalanced number of images per cluster. One of your clusters might end up having 10 observations. The other cluster might end up having one hundred observations. And if you look at the ImageNet data, in the case where you know your labels, that's a balanced data set. Per each class, you have around 1,000 images. But this is violated here. You're going to have unbalanced labels. How do you deal with that? Rather than sampling images, this is a technique for dealing with unbalanced classes. Rather than sampling from your image space, you're going to sample from the pseudo label space, you pick four or five labels, and then per each label, you select five or 10 images. And then that's the way that you're going to construct your mini batch. And then this is going to help you escape trivial parameterization for your neural network, where your neural network is biased towards one of the clusters. Let's see some results. You do your feature learning this way. Once the pre-training is done, you're going to do transfer learning you look at the last features here, and then you can change the head from perhaps a classification task to a detection task. This is object detection. You put bounding boxes around objects in your scene, or it could be segmentation where you're going to do per pixel prediction. This is the best competitor from before this work. That's going to get you these numbers. And FC six and eight is if you cut your neural network after the fully connected layer six or eight. This is if you keep all of these layers. This is the best competitor. Some of these metrics are different from accuracy. The metrics we cover in part one of the course, what are the proper metrics for detection and segmentation? Perhaps mean average precision is reported here. Deep cluster trained on ImageNet data only, where you remove the labels from ImageNet. And then you do classification, that's going to give you the best. De do detection, segmentation. And if you increase your data, for some cases, it is helping you. And for some cases, it is not. This is another object detection data set, Pascal VOC 2007. Deep cluster is giving you the best mean average precision. And this is mean average precision on instance level image retrieval. So two typical data sets for image retrieval are Oxford and Paris 6K data. These are typical data sets for transfer learning. Again, these data sets we cover in part one of the course, and then this is doing the best among them. Any questions? Was the cluster clear? Uh, professor, I had a question. So um, I'm assuming that uh, the, the centroids for k-means are initialized uh, each time, like for each iteration, right? These centroids, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't have to you can warm start them, which is sort of doing the transfer learning. It's going to keep adjusting. Oh, I see. Okay, so using the previously used centroids, you're saying? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. And that's yeah, going to make your learning faster. Yeah, yeah, I had that question, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Any other questions?
Okay, perfect.